I'm excited to give the word today. Uh, we've been doing this really incredible series of uh, the last few weeks uh, that I have been really, really excited about called He, someone say He, he. Is. is. So the He in this sentence is Jesus. And so we've been talking the past uh, two weeks, and so today uh, I have a new message uh, today that's called It's Time to Catch the Wave. Someone say it's time to catch the wave. Uh, so I am what you call a local. So I grew up in uh, Southern California, and I grew up in South Orange County, which I kind of feel is like a rarity if you go to L.A. or Newport Beach today, because everyone's from everywhere. And so I grew up in a town right by the beach. And so I, you, what you do is you call that spoiled. And so I was spoiled, because I grew up by the beach. And so even to this day, people ask me to vacation. And almost always, people say, we should vacation by the beach. And I'm like, no, we should go to the mountains, or maybe the desert, or like a great spa. Like, I'm, I'm the thorn in the side of all my friends that always want to go to the beach for spring break. I'm the weird one who always wants to go to, like, Colorado. Well, why? Because I grew up by the beach, right? And so I, I, it was brought to my attention this week uh, when I was hanging out with my mother, Pastor Paige, and we were talking about old stories. And, I, and she asked me, do you remember the time I taught you how to boogie board? Who's been boogie boarding before? A lot of you guys. And I actually remember this. So I remember I was like 7 to 12. Clearly, I remember it really super well. Somewhere in between then. And I remember that the beach was like a cool thing to do. Like my mother would take us to the beach. But mostly when I was a kid, I would kind of hang out in the sand. And so I like to build things. People who know me know I'm a 32-year-old with more Legos than your 7-year-old. I love building things. I'm like a big, maybe another life I should have been an engineer or something super nerdy. I became a pastor. But back, I just like building things. So, so I would love to hang out in the sand, and I would build sand castles. And so for most of my kid life, that was my experience of the beach. To go to the beach was to go build a sandcastle. And I remember when my mom finally said, you know, hey, son, you're not really going in the water very much. My mother's super athletic, so I think she was a little worried about my nerdiness when I was younger. She, like, really wanted to encourage me to do more active things. And so uh, she, she, like, kind of pleaded with me and made a bargain with me. She bought me a boogie board, and she was like, Stefan, we're going to go boogie boarding. And I go, fine. I will do it. I will assess your proposition. I will try it out. We will see if I like it. Monique's laughing because you knew me when I was nine. We will we'll see how this goes. So I went out with my mother, and we <laughs> tried to boogie board. And for about an hour and a half, I was failing miserably. Like, it wasn't good. Like, I was... I remember I was like super chafed here, like my nipples were hurting, like sand was everywhere. It wasn't good. Like I was not having fun. This was not my vision of going to the beach. Like I wanted my sandcastle and now I'm stuck on this stupid board trying to appease my mother so I can like burn off calories. I don't know. It was a lot for me. And, and I was there and I remember I, I told my mom I'm fed up, like I'm done, like I'm not doing this. Like, we are going to Bristol Farms, and that is final. <laughs> and so my mom was like, okay, I'll make you a deal. Just one more, because I promise you, if you get this, it'll change everything for you. If you could just figure out how to catch this wave, everything will be different. And Stefan, I'm telling you, because I know you don't believe me that I'm wiser than you. And so just try one more time, and I go, ugh. And I remember I turned to my mom and I go, is this, I think the word was, is, is this a request or a demand? She goes, it's a demand. <laughs> so I remember I got on the board one more time. I aligned myself properly. I realized what I was doing wrong is when you're boogie boarding, it's all about aligning with the wave and going with it. I wasn't doing that. I was doing my own thing because I had never done it before. And so finally I aligned properly. A wave came that was bigger than a lot of the other ones, and I took off. 
And I remember yelling <laughs> straight. I had such a rush. And it was like, in a second, I got it. Like, I get why people go to the beach now. Like, I understand, like, what the wave is about, man. Like, I could, you could even hear it in my, I already started talking like a surfer, even like 30 seconds in. And so I remember just being so excited. And so I said, Mom, we got to do it again. And I refused to leave the beach. And so I spent the next three hours learning how to boogie board. And I will never forget that experience because it was like that moment, once I learned how to align myself with the wave, it was like a whole world opened. Everything was different. Going to the beach meant something different. And so before I knew what to do, I'd go and play in the sand. But after I knew what to do, I would go and I would boogie board and eventually bodyboard and eventually surf. And now I knew that when I went to the beach, I would be in the water and I wouldn't be a spectator. But I would be watching, I would be involved in what was happening. How cool is that? And so we've been talking about Ephesians, and Paul is writing a letter to a church in Ephesus. And one of the things I love about Paul is that, and we talked about it two weeks ago, is he's a person who's obsessed with the good news of Jesus. He is so convinced about who Jesus is. He's so convinced about what God is doing in the world. He's so convinced of his purpose in the world, of what he's called to do, of how he's supposed to live his life and how he's supposed to speak and how he's supposed to live and how he's supposed to treat other people. He's so convinced. It's almost like he knows something that other people don't know. He has such a revelation about what it means to catch the wave of faith. And so you see this, and I want to read this, and this is uh, Habakkuk 2 through 14, and this is what the prophet says, and this is one of my favorite verses of all time. And so you don't see it quoted a lot, but it's often echoed in the New Testament. And so this is the prophet, and the prophet's talking about when the Messiah is going to come, when Jesus is going to come, and he says, for when Jesus comes, the earth will be filled, someone say filled, with the knowledge, someone say knowledge, of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so what Paul is saying to us is that when Jesus comes to earth, when he resurrects, when he dies for our sins, and God finally has his way in the earth, he's going to fill the world with love, with justice, with truth, with so much peace as if the waters cover the sea. And so Paul says in Ephesians 3.20, he says, to the one who is capable, that's Jesus, to the one who is capable of doing far, far more than we can ask or imagine. Granted, the power, so the, the power that can do all these things have been granted in us. It's working in us. To him be the glory in the church and in King Jesus, to all generations and to the ages of ages. I love this because it's saying, the Paul is saying that if you can just know what God is doing, We've been talking about this the last few weeks that Paul keeps using this word secret plan. He says that, that as Jews, we, we were told that God was the true God. We were told that God was the living God. We were given the law. We were given the Torah. We were given pictures of God in pieces. But now we see clearly and the secret of who God is, the purpose of you and I, the purpose of this world, everything that we have been asking has now been revealed in Jesus. And so Paul is challenging us and he's saying that all of this is happening. That's the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection defeating death. The world being full, being filled. The Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh. All of us being filled with love 
and goodness, the goodness of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God, all of that is happening. What the prophets had finally prophesied would take place is happening now in Jesus. And guess what? It's a really big wave. And if you can just catch the wave of the Spirit, like the waters cover the sea, if you could just catch the love of God, like this wave, it's like liquid love. It's so interesting. Um, Pastor Tim is someone who often will pray for people and uh, they'll get healed, right? This is something we do at this church. We pray for people a lot and we believe uh, in prophesying over people and the gifts of the spirits. And, and often when you talk to Pastor Tim or even Pastor Paige and they describe the experience, they'll almost always describe it like a river. What they'll say is they'll say, it's like, it's like the spirit was moving and then I just learned to hear. It was like that person needed that word. Like God was looking at that family and was going to restore that family. And all I did was hear it and catch the wave. Amen? And so what I love about what Paul is, he says that that's what's happening. The Spirit of God is working on behalf of God for the purposes of God. And so what God has also done is he's taken that spirit and he's given it to the church. Translation, it's working in us. Someone say, the spirit is working in me. I love this idea. I, I remember when I was um, often, when I bodyboarded, I eventually learned how to surf and, and there's a word called the swell. And so the swell is the place where the wave really starts to draw in, and then it falls over. And so you always were looking for the swell, because that's where, like, the base of power, like, came from. So it's all about aligning yourself and being in the right position. And so what Paul is saying is that the church is the swell. So if the resurrection of Jesus is the wave, if the Holy Spirit, which is poured out on all flesh, is the wave... If the goodness of God who is looking to redeem, restore, and renew every person that ever lived, if that's the desire of God to take this broken creation and to fix it, to take broken families and to fix them, to take people who don't have families and invite them into his family, if God's spirit is doing that, and that is the wave, that is the power of God in the world. If the presence of God is being poured out, if the world is being filled with the glory of God, then the church is the place where that wellspring comes forth. It's the place in the world, give a clap for that, it's the place in the world where God's presence is bursting through. Almost like a hole in a dam. I remember, do you ever watch like Bugs Bunny? There's this amazing episode I love where there's this huge dam and Bugs Bunny is like poking holes in the dam and like all this water is spewing. And so uh, I think it's Wild Coyote is trying to fill them and it's not working. It's kind of like the way the church is. So the church is the people of God in the world. So we are the people of God. So we are the people who are awake to the secret revealed plan. That's what Paul is saying. You have been awakened to who God is. Everyone else thinks God is far away. God is here. Everyone thinks God is just a set of ideas. It's just about believing in some doctrinal statement. No, we, live in a, we, we believe in a living God. Right? Or we also, you hear this a lot, that God isn't present. God works in mysterious ways. I hate when people say that because it's like, well, no. No. Like, God's working in a very profound way. Like, like it wasn't like Jesus came and no one knew why he resurrected. Like, that's what Paul is saying is that God has a plan 
And he's working in and through the resurrection of Jesus. And that resurrection power now has been given to the church. It's been given to us so that we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we might see God's will happen in the world. Is anybody hearing me? And so, you know, it's interesting. We were just talking earlier today. We had a, a meeting outside with our Inspired team, and, and we talked about the vision of this church. And so the vision of this church is to be God's redeemed people reflecting God's glory into all the world. Well, what does that mean? Well, to be God's redeemed people is to be people who catch the wave. It's to be people who are so full of God's glory, to be so full of God's goodness, to be so full of his grace, to be so full of his love, to know God and to know the ways of God. And so that's what it means to be a person of God, is to take what God is doing and to say, I not only said yes to Jesus, but I said yes to following Jesus, I said yes to being a part of Jesus' people, and God, fill me like the waters cover the sea. Fill my life with everything you have. Let the dead things burn off of me. Let the things that are holding me back burn off of me. Let the things that aren't serving me burn off of me. And let me fill my cup with who you are. Let me fill my life with your goodness. I will tell you now, I want to be a person that is full of God's goodness. I keep thinking of, do you ever go to a restaurant and there's like a waiter who's carrying around like a, like a cup that's like too full, right? And then everyone gets nervous because they're like sloshing like water everywhere. That's me. I want to be that cup. I want to be so full of the goodness of God and the love of God that I am just like spilling it everywhere I go. And that's why we have, that's the second part of the vision statement of this church. It's to be God's redeemed people, but who reflect God's glory. It's to show people through our lives who God is. Which is a heck of a, a, heck of a thing. And so we do that in two ways. The first way we do it is through our behavior. So the way that we live and the way that we have, and what happens is that happens naturally because what happens is we discover who God is and we discover who Jesus is and we begin to spend time with God and the dead things begin to burn off of us. So the resentment, gone. We burn it off. The unforgiveness, you burn it off. The jealousy, you burn it off. That greed that you have, you burn it off. All those, all those feelings that make you feel like you can't control yourself, like those drives. The more time we spend with God and his word and prayer and, and we get into understanding what he's doing, his goodness becomes our goodness. And so that's why when we reflect God's glory, when we as broken people who are imperfect tried to serve an amazing God, and his goodness becomes manifest in our lives. And then what happens is people begin to see our lives, and they not only see your life, but what they also see is what God has done in your life. That's what people always kind of miss. They get the first part, so they think it's all about living perfectly, right? And so it's all about living perfectly, and you have to live perfectly, and Within that kind of paradigm, what ends up happening is that you not only have all this pressure, but then judgment comes. And, but it's not about living perfectly. It's about people looking at your life and being able to see what God has done. Because that's what the goodness is. Because when you're around God and you know the ways of God, his goodness begins to change you. And then people begin to see. Your life begins to witness to his glory your life begins to show even me with all my faults, flaws, and failures. I'm hopeful. Even me. Sure, I did those things in the past. Sure, I haven't been the best brother or sister. But you know what? I'm going to choose grace today. 
Sure, I have not always been at the best of mind or I haven't always felt the most confident, but you know what? I'm going to be brave today. I'm going to step out today. And it's like, what's the difference? Jesus. And so when you reflect God's glory, what you're doing is your life witnesses to the reality of God. I like to put it this way. Your life proves God's existence. Because there would have been no way that you could have changed if it was not for grace. Amen? And so the final part of our vision statement is to all the world. Well, what does that mean? It means that we announce Jesus everywhere we go. That means we have a missional call like Paul to step up and step out. And we do that through the church. We do that in our families. We do that in our relationships. We take every opportunity to reflect God's glory in the world and to know that God has, been, has asked us to partner with him in his redemption project, in his saving project of the world. And so when we choose to say yes to Jesus and we join his church, what we also begin to do is we take on the call to be God's hands and feet. We take on the call to be the solution in a broken world. You know, I love this line. I say this a lot, and I really believe this, is that we were saved not from the world. That's a very popular idea today. We get told that a lot. We, the reason why we're saved is to leave the world. But in fact, what Paul is telling us is, no, you were saved for the world. You weren't saved from the world. You were saved for the world. Translation, a redeemed world doesn't happen without redeemed people. A redeemed world does not happen without redeemed people. That's why I think a lot of times when you see people who hold families in church, almost always, you'll find that it was like one person first. It was like our family was in dysfunction. God called me. He healed me. And then I became the light. And so God loved me so much, he not only took me, he not only invited me, but he also invited my family. God not only restored me, but he was also restoring my children's children. And so that is in Paul's voice. God has revealed the secret, which is Jesus. And It is by Jesus that the world is being filled. This is Ephesians 4, 1, 2. And this is Paul. He says, so then, this is my appeal to you. Yes, it's me, the prisoner in the Lord. You must live up to the calling you have received. I want to talk about calling just for a few minutes. Who wouldn't mind if I just, like, really got technical and hermeneutical just for about three minutes. Is that okay? I know it's like towards the end of the message. But part of why I think the idea of calling is hard in our culture is because we live in a world that is obsessed with self-actualization. And so the definition of life is to flourish fully as a human being. And that's like what culture tells us. And so I was reading the other day like Maslow, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. A lot of psychologists talk about this. He said, Maslow says, the goal of, of, the, of life is to, is to be a person that self-actualizes. Or, or we see this a lot in self-help. Like the goal of life to say yes to your calling is for you to self-actualize or to manifest who you really are. And so we often think about that as a modern idea, but the first person who taught that was actually Aristotle, who lived 300 years before Jesus. And so Aristotle was running around telling people that the way to live your life is for you to flourish as an individual. That the highest ideal, your ethic, should be to do things that make you flourish as a person. And so even though it was 2,000 years ago, people in Paul's day were used to that definition of calling in the same way that we are. So we, as humans, automatically think that the true goal in life is to maximize our own personal human potential, and then everything slots into that. So if that's your highest ideal, then the church is just 
one of those things that help you. Yoga is one of those things that help you. My therapist is one of those things that help you. Pastor Stefan, are you saying I shouldn't do yoga or I shouldn't go to my therapist? No, those are good things. But what I'm saying is that they're not resurrection. And so what Paul is trying to get us to see in this scripture is he's saying that you must live up to the calling you have received. Translation, there's something bigger than spending your whole life building sand castles in the sand. There is something bigger than that. There is a wave that is here. And that wave is so much bigger than anything you ever thought was possible. And that wave is from the living God. And that wave is going to renew everything. It's going to fill the world with his love, justice, and truth. The kingdom of God is at hand. And you're still building castles. Translation, live up to your calling. Self-help is great. Yoga is great. But it's not resurrection. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so that's what Paul is saying to us. He's saying that in us, you're thinking too small, Ephesus. Get into the resurrection power and catch the wave. And if you can just catch the wave, you could be full with the goodness of of God. Can the worship team come up for me? Give a clap for our worship team as they come up here. And so my close is this. Today, let's be filled with the goodness of God. Let's choose to be people who are filled. This is Ephesians 4.13. This is Paul. The purpose of this I love that Paul always says, he always speaks in like these, he'll like, it's it's always a letter, so there's always these like interesting transitions. So the purpose is this, that we should reach unity in our belief and loyalty in knowing God's son. That's us, the church, that we should reach unity together. Then we shall reach the stature of the mature man measured by the standards of the king's fullness. Maturity, Christian maturity, is defined by the measure of fullness in your life. What a beautiful idea. So maturity, isn't, maturity is not what you've done. It's what he's done. Maturity is not what you've built. It's saying yes to what he's doing. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying if you could just catch the wave, that's what faith is about. Whether you're a pastor like myself, whether you're a leader, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're a, a, a parent, whether you're a business owner, God is calling you to align your life with His Spirit. God is calling you to align your life with his purposes. He's calling you to let his goodness be your goodness. To be full to the measure of everything he has for us. And I will tell you this, I think that the world needs filled people. I think that the world needs filled people of God. Christians that are literally in their families and in their lives who are like spilling his grace (laughs) everywhere we go. Imagine if the world was filled with mature believers, people of God who were full to the measure of God's goodness in the world. I think that's why this church has been called by God. I think that's why every person who has come here, that's when next week when we celebrate 
everything God is going to do in the future of this church when we celebrate the six years and we celebrate every person that has given, that has served. Well, what is all that doing? That is all of us saying yes to the wave of God that he wants to pour out in this city. And we are saying we want to be that swell. We want to be in your presence. We want to be filled by you. We want to be transformed by you. We want to know you, God, in every area of our lives so that we might become your people in the world. I'm done preaching. Let's give the Lord a clap. If everyone could stand with me. I'm going to have Pastor Paige come up. Just pray with me, and then I'm going to ask uh, the worship team to do a song, and let's just praise God. Who has four minutes in them to praise God? Just pray with me. Father, fill us. Fill every single one of us. I don't know what's on the heart of everyone in this room. I don't know what their week was like. I don't know what they're going through. But regardless of our challenges, regardless of where we're suffering, regardless of our doubts, Father, we know that you are here. You are the living God. And we open ourselves to you. Fill us. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your forgiveness. Fill us with your love. Let us be your redeemed people in the world. Let us reflect your glory. And let our goodness be your goodness. Amen. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life Come on, let's lift our hands. So, let's, we're the so swell, right? So let's just, let's get in alignment with God right now. Every breath and let's sing that, that song. I am faithful. I will Come on, look to him. It's all Jesus. Just look to him. Pastor Tim, could you come up here? And all my life you have been faithful. Come on, sing it from your heart. And all my life you have been so, so good. Come on and lift your hands. Every breath that I Of the goodness. Of the goodness. Of God. Somebody give the Lord a big clap like he's awesome. Come on. It's your goodness is ready now to is ready now to me. It's your goodness is ready now to is ready now to me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I'll give you Goodness is running after me. So let us teach you. Let us teach you how to go into alignment right now. Just lift your hands towards heaven. Just say these words. Say, Holy Spirit. Say thank you. Thank you for bringing me into alignment. For break into alignment. And just close your eyes because he's speaking to you. Because it's so easy to be just slightly off alignment. Because we're hearing the world's philosophies, as Pastor Stefan was saying, nonstop of what manifestation is. Of being 10x. Or maxing out. Or whatever that may be. But the Apostle Paul said, walk worthy of your calling. So what is your calling in this world today? The calling of being a mother, that's a, a mighty calling. To be a husband is a mighty calling. To be a parent is a mighty calling. To be the sound person at a church is a mighty calling. 
So, Lord, we thank you that we go into alignment today. And we ask that we will decrease and you will increase. I want you to say this. Say, God, God increase, increase my flow. My flow. Now, just breathe that in. That's God's presence just went through you. I want everybody in the building to say these words. Say, Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Come into my life. Come into my life. In a new and special way. In a new and special way. Say, thank you for forgiving me of sin. Thank you for forgiving me of sin. And cleansing me of all wrongdoing. Cleanse me from all wrongdoing. Say, Jesus. Jesus. You're the Lord of my life. You're the Lord of my life. Now just lift your hands and breathe that in. And Pastor Paige is going to pray over the women. There's so many women that are watching online and that are here that are getting healed. And as she prays, the next two minutes, watch what begins to happen in this church. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that we know that he is a spirit that heals. I pray for marriages to be healed today. There's a lot of women that have been in anxiety and in stress and depression. There's a lot of pressure on women in the workplace. They're holding so many things. So, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for your resurrection power. And I thank you right now that we are able to receive. So open up your hearts, women right now and just receive from the goodness of God. Bring healing. We release healing. We release balance. Some of you cannot sleep at night. You have so many things happening with your children. You're carrying burdens. And the Holy Spirit right now is going to release you from those burdens. So we receive it now. We receive the goodness of God, the wave of the Spirit, to bring mercy, grace, healing, and power. In Jesus' name, we pray. Watch what Callie does with this song. And I want to just say, Callie's parents are here. Could you guys look at me, you good-looking people? She's so fantastic. Thank you for letting her stay in Southern California. <laughs> give, give, give Callie's parents a big clap. They're awesome people. Give Kelly a big clap. Sing this song as we end today. And all my life you have been faithful. Just go there in your mind. Just try this. Just lift your hands. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am. I will see of the goodness of God. All my life you have been what? And all my life you have been faithful. Yeah. All my life. All my life you have been so, so Of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God one more time. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I speak over your life as a man of God that your life will flourish. It will flourish. In the month of October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Somebody clap your hands like your life will flourish. Come on, keep on clapping like it's going to happen. I want you to look. I want you to look for the goodness of God today. For this is the day that the Lord hath made. And I want you to see that. And I want to just say before Pastor Paige and I talk about next week, can you give Pastor Stefan another big clap? My God. That teaching is blowing wow. me away. I, know. <laughs> I mean, I got to sit for 40 years. It was always me, Brian Houston, Joyce Myers, me, Joyce Meyer, T.D. Jakes, 
me, Creflo Dollar, Tim Story, Creflo Dollar, Joyce Myers. This guy's blowing me away because he is like practically showing me Christianity. Yeah. Give him another big clap. Yeah. Fantastic. Like, wow. I mean, I was thinking when in the teaching, I mean, you have caught a few waves, haven't you? Yes. I have caught a few waves, you know, s over 75 countries and in so many different situations, whether they're poor, black, white, rich, the goodness of God, you have seen the goodness of God. I have seen the goodness yes. of God. And just to hear him articulate this, to catch that wave and to say that this is the calling that all of us share. We all have it. It's not an individual so much about me, but it's we are joined together as the body of Christ to bring the glory of God on the earth. And, and the fact so that we awesome. represent God. And so if you're a school teacher, you represent God. Mm. If you are a police officer, you represent God. It's not just these famous human beings. Yeah, we're reflecting God's glory. We're reflecting there. God's glory. Why are you excited about our sixth anniversary this coming Sunday? Why are you excited? Well, we're going to have so many guests here. Yes. And of course, people are flying in from yeah. different places. And we have a, a very excellent teacher. You're not going to, you, you don't want to miss this. Pastor Charles Neiman from El Paso. Now he pastors a church of 40,000. They have 16,000 people coming to the churches on Sunday. So listen, he's here to, to speak. And uh, we have so many great things for the family. Yes. So we just want to bring back the community, Tim. Yes. You know, because people have been scattered through the... They've been scattered. And yeah. just so you guys know why, why we're so steady in unsteady times. Mm -hmm. Like, if you see gaps in the attendance, just so you know, we're not nervous. No. Because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Like, when Vietnam hit, how many of you know we didn't all know what to do? Just lift your hands, okay? So, in the midst of this pandemic, as I talked to so many of my pastor friends, like Charles Neiman... These churches have been hit. They have 40,000 members. Yeah. So you don't see it as much. But when you have a church that's just under six years old, sure. you see it more often. Absolutely. But can I tell you something about you? You guys have been faithful in your Amen. giving. That's right. And all you online people have been faithful. So we continue to thrive. You should clap your hands like this is awesome. But what we're asking for as two adult leaders, yeah. we've both been at this forever, is we want the body to come back. Amen. We That's really right. need to touch each other, to be around each other. So I'm asking you, will you do me a favor, please, and invite two people for next week, three you people, come next week. four people, five people. For real, it's, a lot of it's got to come from you guys. How many would do your best to bring people next week? so we could celebrate as a, as a family. Hello, it's Tim Story. I hope you enjoyed the service. If so, subscribe. If not, still subscribe. It's good.